perplexed, baffled, confounded, dumbfounded, puzzled, lost, beached, high and dry, marooned, stranded, immovable. I'm going to read them again. Perplexed, baffled, confounded, dumbfounded, puzzled, lost, beached, high and dry, marooned, stranded, immovable. These are all synonyms for the word stuck. And you don't need me to to ask you if you've ever been stuck. We know what it's like. Now, maybe you've never been stuck. Your car's never been stuck. But you know what it's like to be stuck somewhere. You know what it's like to be stuck at the airport. You know what it's like to be stuck in a relationship. You know what it's like to be stuck in a job. You know what it's like to be stuck in a neighborhood. You know what it's like to be stuck with your parents. I mean, there's a lot of things that you know what it's like to be stuck with. I'll be fair. You know what it's like to be stuck with your kids? (laughs) We understand that. Unfortunately, for most of us, it's very easy for us to get stuck in our relationship with God. We get stuck in what it means to walk with Him. And we're in this series that we're going to be in that's going to take us right up to Easter where we're, we're, we've titled it Living the Truth, and it's, it's based off of our, our tagline for our church to live the truth of Jesus in everyday life. And, and that tagline really came out of this frustration of being stuck. And far more people who say that they're Christians are stuck in their walk with God than they are thriving in their relationship with God. And so that's what we're talking about. And we're talking about this whole concept of how Jesus is is constantly inviting people. And he's saying, come follow me, come follow me, come follow me. And he never said, come believe in me by the way. <laughs> he said, come follow me. Come, come do the things that I'm doing. Come follow me. Be my disciple. Be my follower. And that Hebrew word is Talmudin. To be my Talmudin. And, and we've talked about how that word Talmudin is the PhD level. It's not the grade school level. It's not the college level. It's the PhD level. Come be my Talmudin. And there's, there's three goals of a Talmudin. What's the first one? We talked about it last week. We were going to practice five minutes a day this week. What's it called? Be with Jesus. See, you're stuck. You're stuck. You can't even remember what we talked about last week. You're stuck. you got to do more than show up to church. Because if all you're doing is showing up to church, you're just wasting Sunday morning. I mean, if, if you can't remember, be with Jesus. Talmudin, come follow me, the words of Jesus. What's the first goal of being a Talmudin? Be with Jesus. That's the answer. How did your five minutes go this week? Oh, yeah. Second goal, be like Jesus. Third goal, do what Jesus did. This is what it means to do that, to be a disciple, to walk with God. Luke chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Luke chapter 6. It'll be our primary passage of Scripture. And I forgot my glasses, so I'll try to read this. I think I can remember it. Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 39 through 40. He also told them a parable. Can the blind guide the blind? Won't they both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. And this is the words of Jesus, and he's, he's, he's teaching them here in Luke chapter 6, and he asks a rhetorical question. He asks a question that everybody knows the answers to. And the question is, can the blind, can, can the blind guide the blind? 
No, the blind can't because neither one of them can see. Uh, they'll both end up in the pit. They'll both end up following in the, following, falling in the ditch. A disciple, a Talmudine, is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. What is the point of being a Talmudine? What is the point of being a follower of Jesus? What is the point of being a Christian? What is the point with walking with God? However you want to define that. What is the point of being saved? What, what, what is the point of that? Unfortunately, in modern Christian America, most people will answer that question by saying, well, to go to heaven. To go to heaven when I die. That that's the point. Except for the master teacher... Jesus never says that's the point. Is that a reward? Is that the end destination? You bet. And I, just, I don't want to rain on your parade. I know it's raining today, but I don't want to rain on your parade. If you don't enjoy being with Jesus now, what makes you think you're going to enjoy being with him in heaven? Because if you think Jesus is in charge here, <laughs> wait till you get to heaven. Wait till you get there. What's the point of being a Talmudine? Jesus just gave a not complicated parable that anybody can understand because he blatantly tells us the answer. What is the point of being a Talmudine and what we just read? To be like the teacher, <laughs> to be like Jesus. This is the point. And he says to be fully trained. Well, if you can be fully trained, that means you also can be partially trained. That means you can kind of be trained. That means you can just be starting your training. And all of those things are fine. The, 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 the issue is not... Where am I on that? I need to know where I am in my journey. But am I stuck? Am I stuck? Am I, am I in the same place I've always been? Or am I making progress to be more like Jesus? And to where my life is more reflective of the things that Jesus talks about and the things, the way that he's created us to be. The point is to be like Jesus, to be transformed into his likeness. That is the point. Now, it also takes training. It takes training for us to do this. So that means we have to be taught. It means we have to set time aside. It means we have to do all of the things that are necessary in that uh, to be trained. It's also going to take time. And that's, that's one of the hardest things about the Christian faith. Because we're impatient people anyway. And we live in a time and in a culture. I, I, think it's, I do think it's harder to be a Christian. I think it's harder to be a Talmudine today than it's ever been. And I'm not saying it was easy for them. I'm not saying that. I, th I think if, if we lived in their time, we'd say this is the hardest time it's ever been to Talmudine. Okay? I think we would say that. But today we have so many options. And we have been trained. You are fully trained. I hope you're, you're, you're well aware you're fully trained, right? Do you understand you're fully trained? Just look around the room. Everybody's sitting, nice, respectful, <laughs> nodding. Even if you're not listening, you're nodding. If I make eye contact, here's what I know everybody's going to do when I make eye contact with them. They start nodding. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's right, amen. Amen, brother. Amen, yes, that's right. I don't know what you're saying because I was thinking about the football game, but <laughs> amen, that's good. <laughs> now when I look at you, you're going to go, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Should I nod? Should I not nod? I'm going to look down. I'm just, uh, just going to be in prayer. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> the point, the point of being a Talmudin is to be like the teacher, is to be like Jesus. And so we have to be trained, and that takes time, and we have to go into this, and we have to, this is, this is what we need. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, 2 Corinthians 3.18, 
says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in the mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the spirit. Our, our, the, the veil has been taken off. If we're in Christ, the veil has been taken off and we're in the process of being transformed. It is an ongoing thing. You don't graduate from being transformed. You're always going to be tra- in the process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Now, here's the thing that I, 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 I think I know about you. It's a Sunday morning. It's rainy. It's blah February. And you're at church. Now, you're either at church because someone has drug you here. Okay? And I understand that. That's fine. You're welcome. I'm glad you're here. Or you want to change. Or you wouldn't be here. There's some element in you that wants to change. There's some element in you that wants to be more like God. There's some element in you that wants to have more faith in Jesus. There's some element in you that wants to be a better person. Or you wouldn't be here. Now, there's a lot of people who are not going to go to church today, who don't ever go to church, and they're not interested in any of those things. Now, they may try to, to better themselves, as, but it's in um, the bookstore Friday night, Amelia and I, and I came to this section, and, there's, and, the, and the, the title of this section now is Self-Transformation. They're using the word transformation now, but it's self-transformation. And I'm listening. I'm going, listen. I got one question for you. If you're trying to transform yourself, how is that going? Because that's probably not going so well. Self-transformation. You want to change, and chances are you've tried to change. I'm I'm going to try. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do this. I'm going to read my Bible this week. Three weeks later, where's, where's my Bible? And you try. I want... And I try, I think the thing we've got to spend some time with and get really, really good at as individuals and a, Arnaldo, you bring me my water there, bud, <coughs> is we, we got to get, we got to get really good. Thank you. Oh, and my glasses. Look at that. <laughs> Overachiever. We got to get really good at how to change. Not not do I want to change. That's very important. Because if you don't want to change, no chance. And if you're not willing to try, no chance. But we got to get to a place, okay, well, how do I change? What are the specific things that I need to be doing to change? What things do I need to start? What things do I need to eliminate? If I am going to to be like Jesus. Now, being like Jesus, when we think about this whole idea about being like Jesus, and you think about the things that Jesus taught. I know some of you are worried I'm going to kick that over. I might. (laughs) It's just water. That's fine. The teachings of Jesus are not complicated. In fact, Jesus narrowed all of his teachings down to one uh, with the disciples right before he goes to the cross, and it was what? Love one another. That is not a hard concept. Now, is it easy to do? No. Some people make it very, very hard to love them. But the idea of loving each other is not a hard concept. Uh, It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the teaching of Jesus. Is that a hard concept? No. It's not. Can it be hard to do? To get out of a certain, like, I'm supposed to be served instead of serve? That, that That can be a hard habit to break, but the concept's not hard. Hey, listen, you might want to get the log out of your eye before you talk about the speck in somebody else's. Is that a hard concept? 
No? Is it hard to practice? Eh, yeah. The teachings of Jesus, to be like Jesus, really, they're not hard. We don't sit around and go, oh my gosh, I don't know what he means by turn the other cheek. I don't know what he means by walk the extra mile. I don't know what he means when he says to treat others the way you want to be treated. I just can't get that concept. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what's happening. But we're stuck. We get stuck. We're not growing. Or if we're growing, it's painfully slow. It's like, okay, so what do we, what do, we do with this? Now, whether you talk about discipleship or use the Hebrew word and talk about Talmudin or you talk about walking with God or living the truth of Jesus in everyday life or the Christian life, whatever you want to talk about, the classic term in Christianity for that is spiritual formation. You are being formed by someone and something a hundred percent of the time. The question is not, do you have faith? Sometimes we'll hear that. You know, you'll hear that on TV or you'll, some, they'll be talking about the quarterback and they'll say, oh, he's a man of faith. Okay, first of all, every person is a person of faith. I understand what they're saying. This, they're saying this person's vocal about his, his Christian faith and he, he talks about it and it's very important to him. I understand what he's saying. But every human being is a person of faith. The question is, what's your faith in? Every human being worships. You got to worship somebody. You're created to worship. You're worshiping something. The question is, who are you worshiping? And you are being transformed. You are being formed by someone, something is forming you all the time. So what we have to look at is we have to look at this. Okay, well, what or who is forming me. So we're going to look at four realities. And we're not going to get through all the notes today, um, so we'll just pick up next week. Um, and these four realities are not in the notes. Um, you have to make them on your own if you want to make notes. Four realities when it comes to spiritual formation. The first one is this is that for the most part, your spiritual formation is unintentional. You're not being intentional with it. We have so much unintentional spiritual formation in our life. We have been trained in so many ways. We live in a time and a culture where we have been trained to expect how long should the website page, how long should it take it to load? How long should it take it to load? Somebody tell me. Immediately. Immediately. Not a minute and a half. Not 90 seconds. Not 15 seconds. I mean, if it doesn't load in 0.1 second, you're, going, you're pounding the desk. Why is this so slow? This is what you've been trained to do. How long does it take to prepare dinner? Now, if you're a fancy cook and you're a chef and you spend eight hours in the kitchen, first of all, why haven't you invited us for dinner? But unless you're that, if you're that, just get out of the way. If you're a normal person, how long do you generally think it should take to cook dinner? Eh, 15 minutes. You're going to put it in the microwave? Yes. Yeah, you, you're, we're, we're trained in so many ways. So many things that we're trained in. Unintentional spiritual formation. Here's the big key, big, big key when it comes to un. Um, we're just, we're, we need to be aware of it because we're generally not aware of it. We are formed by the stories that we believe. And the number one thing that forms you is the stories you believe. For some of you, you've believed all your life that you're unworthy. And that has formed you. Some of you believe there's no point in getting close to anybody because whenever you get close to somebody, they leave. That story has formed you. Some of you are formed or being formed that, that something's always got to be wrong. Something's always got to be wrong. Something's always got to be hurting. Something's got to be sick. Something, something's always got to be wrong. 
That, that story that you're telling yourself, that is forming you. The stories you believe form you. The stories you don't believe form you. If you don't believe in a physical resurrected Jesus, that forms you. If you don't believe the scripture, the Bible is the inspired written word of God, that forms you. The stories that we believe, the stories that we tell ourselves, and the stories that we don't believe all form us. So I ask you a question, what stories are you believing? It's a rainy afternoon. It's the first Sunday with no football. Maybe go to a coffee shop this afternoon. Sit down with your journal. Write it at the top of the quick page. What stories am I believing? What stories am I believing? And why are you believing them? And what road is that taking you down? We are being formed by stories because we are narrative beings. You love story. Our movies are stories. Our music is stories. Our commercials are stories. We're surrounded by stories. What's the second thing that forms us? And we're formed by our habits. We're formed by our habits. I apologize, I should have put some of these, these statements up on the screen, but I just didn't. Listen to this. What you do on a daily basis is what you become. I don't know about you, but that's hard to hear for me. <clears throat> I have a hard time with that one. What I did this past week is actually my life. Do you ever think about that? What you did the past seven days, that's your life. Does that thrill you or depress you? Or is it just kind of, hmm? What you do on a daily basis is what you become. Now I'm going to say this one, this next one really slow, because I don't want to say doo-doo in church, Okay. The things we do, do something to us. The things we do, do something to us. So whatever your habits are, whether they're good or whether they're bad, they do something to you. There's another one that's strong. My loves... Shape my daily practice. My loves shape my daily practice. You will do what you love. I'm going to say it again. You will do what you love. If you say, well, Marty, I love to play golf, and I ain't played golf in three and a half years. You don't love golf. You might like it, but you don't love it. Marty, I just love being in a community group. Well, what community group? I haven't been in one in nine years. You don't love being in a community group. Marty, I just love giving. What you giving to? Well, nothing right now. You don't love giving. What you love will impact what you do. We're formed by the stories that we believe and the stories we don't believe. We are formed by our habits Uh, I got one more. I can't, I can't. This is a good one, too. What you love has more impact on your life than what you know to be true in your head. What you love has more impact on your life than what you know to be true in your head. 
you know to you know it to be true in your head you're supposed to get up and exercise but you love sleeping in what you love has far more impact on your life than what you know to be true in your head so we're formed by the narratives the stories that we believe and we're formed by our habits third thing that forms us major thing that forms us relationships relationships who you spend your time with who are you involved with relationships that you are involved in will shape your life I've been saying it for a long time I got it from my mom you show me your friends I'll show you your future you hang, you hang around toxic people, you'll be toxic. You hang around lazy people, you'll be lazy. You hang around people that don't have anything to do with God, you won't have anything to do with God. You hang around people who are pursuing God, you'll start pursuing God. That's just the way that it is. Who you hang around and the relationships that you have and that you develop and that you feed is going to have an enormous impact on your life. And then the fourth thing, so there's the stories that we tell ourselves that we believe and don't believe. There's our habits. There's the relationships that we're involved with. And the fourth one is the environment that you live in. We all live in an environment. Now, we share something in common. We all live in Las Vegas. And does living in Las Vegas impact us? Yes, it does. Some of y'all actually think it's raining outside. <laughs> and I'm just going to tell you, being from southern Louisiana, central Mississippi, I've lived here for 17 years. It hadn't rained yet. <laughs> Where we live, in, it, it forms you. You will find yourself going, where's the Starbucks? As I've been three blocks and I haven't seen a Starbucks. What's going on? There should be a Walgreens and a Starbucks on every corner. Living in Las Vegas will, it will form you this way. You expect everything to be open all the time. Here's another one. If you walk into a room with a stage and a microphone, and lights. What do you expect? Don't you lie to me. Don't you lie to me. What do you expect? It to be good. Now, when you live in Topeka, Kansas, you don't have that expectation. <laughs> they got one Starbucks, and it's closed most of the time. No, I have no idea. I've never been to Topeka, Kansas. It may be a booming metropolis. I have no idea. Four things, four things that get in the way or that are forming us, I should say, that are forming us. Our stories that we believe, habits that we do, the relationships are involved in the environments we live in. Two myths, real quick. John Mark Comer does a great job talking about two myths. Matt's going to get ready wherever Matt's at because he's going to come up and share something with us. Two myths, especially in the Christian world. Now listen, listen to all of this before you get mad, okay? So here's the first one. Here's the first myth in the Christian world. All you need to know is the Bible. All you need to know is the Bible. That's not true. Do you need to know the Bible? Yes. If you go to seminaries at Princeton or Harvard and talk to professors who forget more Bible in one afternoon than you'll know in your entire life. If knowing the Bible makes you godly, they will be the most godly people on the planet. And as Ralph can attest, that is not the case. Knowing the Bible is important, but knowing the Bible is not everything. Knowing is not the same as doing. Now listen to this. Y'all have heard me teach that many times. Knowing is not the same as doing. That's not new. Listen to this. Doing is not the same as wanting to do it. 
That's a whole other level. There's doing the right thing, and then there's loving doing the right thing. And if you're from a Bible background, if you're a Baptist background, Reformed background, when I say something like all you, uh, all you need to know is the Bible, you're like, well, well yeah, of course. Like, no, that's kind of where it comes from. Now, I want to pick on our charismatic friends, our Assembly of God people, our Foursquare people, our Hallelujah people. <laughs> that was a weak, that was a weak charismatic right there. That sounds like a converted Baptist charismatic. <laughs> Second myth. Let go, let God. Let go, let God. It's terrible theology. Horrendous theology. Let go, let God. I love this phrase. We'll put it up on the... Let go, let God will be number two. Oh, you don't need to do anything. I'm sorry. That one, same thing. You don't need to do anything. Let go, let God. Try this phrase instead. Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. That's pretty good. Without him, I can't. Without me, he won't. So God's not just going to pick me up, shake me, and pour transformation into my head. He's waiting on me. Now, I can't do it without his help. So I got to have him 